So, uh, good afternoon, bon pomeriggio, dobry dzień, uza ankele lingva russa. Uh, I'm uh, Mikhail Talalai, uh, born in St. Petersburg, Russian historian, uh, but last uh, al almost 30 years, I'm uh, Italy-based. And uh, uh, last uh, years, I was uh, very often in Baku, uh, in Azerbaijan, so I'm missing I'm missing this beautiful country, my friends, my colleagues, and I was uh, very glad to accept uh, their invitation uh, to be chairman and moderator of the panel uh, number 6B. So we are starting. Uh, the uh, name of our panel is uh, Cultural Legacy and Interpretation. And we have uh, five uh, speakers, two uh, Russian speakers and three Italians, but uh, we will uh, go on uh, with the English language. So our first speaker is my uh, colleague, a real colleague from the Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, Lana Ravandi Faddai, who is a senior researcher of the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences, while me, uh, I am a, an associate member of the Institute of Universal uh, History. So please, you are welcomed, uh, the uh, professor, and would you address you in Russian, Lana Mijidovna, using your uh, father's name, your patronymics. We are listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have problem because I cannot um, use a share screen with uh, with my computer because it's very old version, and I bought the new one. <laughs> but it's very difficult for me. Um, I don't know. It's very difficult for me. And um, I prepare presentation, but I don't know how to put this presentation in our chat. I will try to do now. I really, I will try. Sorry, please. One second. Uh, Dante and me. Yeah, the title. Meanwhile, maybe I will um, tell the title of your okay. paper. And uh, how many uh, how many minutes do I have? Uh, unfortunately, only fifteen, uh, dear uh, Lana Mijidovna. Okay. Uh, minutes and I have to be very uh, strict so I have short time and now I will switch on my chronometer and we are starting. Uh, okay um, uh, it's my pleasure to greet the participants of the conference and I would like to express my gratitude to its organizers. My report will be devoted to the Persian uh, miniature and in it I will present several miniatures of Nizami Genjavi book from Bodleian libraries of University of o Oxford and several miniatures from unique book Nizami Genjavi from the collection uh, of the Center for Oriental Literature of the Russian State Library. Um, I, I think maybe in the end of the panel, um, uh, someone can show because I, I really I don't I don't know how to use uh, share screen uh, with this computer. Um, and um, um, uh, um, this collection covered two periods in the history of bookmaking in Persia and uh, Persian. Um, uh, Persian world as uh, the first in the Bodleian, the production um, uh, by hand of beautiful manuscript. Uh, first, uh, several words about Bodleian Library. The founding of the Bodleian Library in 1602 coincided with a time of increasing uh, interest in the East and its holdings later increased uh, through the um, acquisition, um, acquisition of works once owned by renowned uh, scholar collectors. Persian poetry from the secular traditions 
uh, flourished in the princely courts of Iran. It is said uh, that one such uh, prince, uh, Sultan Mahmud um, of uh, Ghaznar, had 400 poets in his uh, retinue. Um, illustrated manuscripts were crafted for elite patrons, which today provide uh, viewers with the uh, opportunity to experience examples of Persian calligraphy, illumination, and miniature painting from the 17th to 18th centuries. One of the richest period um, in the history of the book. Many stories from this period were embraced not only um, in courtly settings, but uh, in all sectors of society told within families and uh, at community gathering. But the manuscripts naturally were available only to an elite few. Uh, diverse themes of narrative and uh, mystical poetry appealed especially to audience uh, in Mughal India and Ottoman Turkey and eventually to in the West. Uh, transcending time and place of stories continues to resonate today and to be retold through uh, contemporary literature and popular culture. This is what brought collectors such as uh, um, Chancellor of uh, Oxford in the 17th century, uh, Archbishop of um, Canterbury, William Lord, uh, to collect books from the East. Um, in 1634, the Archbishop wrote, that uh, there is a great deal of learning feed to be known written in Arabic and great um, scarcity of Arabic and Persian books in this country. Wherefore, every ship and every voyage shall bring home one Arabic on, or Persian manuscript book to be delivered to the master of the company and by him uh, to the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury who shall dispose of them, the king, shall think feed. The uh, curiosity about Muslim word is perhaps striking considerably loud was an in intensely religious Christian against uh, the theater in England and even Christmas celebration. He would later be executed during the civil war uh, that rocked um, England in the 17th century. A generation of collectors began to bring books back uh, to Oxford. Uh, the manuscripts of Nizami uh, preserved, uh, they are mostly from India in the time of the Mughal dynasty. Unfortunately, I cannot show you uh, mi miniatures, but there is one of Leilan Majnun and um, Lord Byron describes the Persian story of Leila and Majnun as the Romeo and Juliet of the East. Uh, Majnun, which uh, means processed uh, by spirits or crazy, was the name given to the semi-legendary seventh, uh, seventh century Arab poet um, Kais ibn Mulawa. Um, when um, he uh, reputedly became mad with love for Leila, his cousin. In uh, Persian accounts, uh, the hopeless lovers meet as uh, school children and fall deeply in love, however they are forbidden um, to marry. Grief striking, Majnun retreats to the desert wild animals, his only um, uh, companions. Leila in time is married to a nobleman, but she remains devoted uh, to Majnun, making several uh, thwarted attempts to meet him. Eventually she dies of broken heart and her obsessed beloved 
follows her to her grave, dying as a um, um, uh, mourns at, at her tombs. And um, I think um, because I cannot show these miniatures, maybe I'm, I will tell um, uh, um, uh, several words about Russian National Library, Nizami, and the age of printed books. Uh, lithography was a printmaking process uh, invented in Germany in the late 18th century. The word uh, come from two Greek words, lithos, uh, which means stone, and grapho, which means to write. Thus, uh, to write with stones, because the template for each page of the book was a stone tablet. While the profession of calligraphy was in fact being phased out by new technologies, all the same, um, the calligraphy was hugely important for lithography because it was still by his hand that the text was transferred to the stone to use for printing in a chemical process that um, I will not go into here. The lithographic calligrapher's job was in, the, in at least one way much more difficult. Uh, among the many unique books uh, in the archives of the Center for Oriental Literature of the Russian Federation is an edition of Nizami Genjevi published in Tehran in the middle of the 19th century. This is an early lithographic book printed on a private printing press. Uh, the legacy of the outstanding representative of classical poetry in the Persian language, Nizami Genjivi, as we have already seen, um, occupies a special place in the history of Iranian manuscript books and also of Iranian book printing during the period of modernization during, during the Qajar dynasty in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, at a time when uh, the lithographic books was replacing the handwritten manuscript, the owners of private lithographic printing, uh, printing presses tried to preserve the beauty of the manuscript, including the quality of paper and illustrations. In some cases, artists made drawings uh, directly onto the onto the, survey, uh, the surface of the pages after printing using the same artistic principles and technique uh, techniques as a manus uh, manuscript books. As scholar uh, Olympiada Shiglova observed in her work, uh, this work names the Iranian lithographic book. Um, the success of lithography in Iran was related to Iranians love of elegantly uh, handwritten texts. A traditional education involved many years of studying calligraphy among, uh, among other subjects. And um, every educated uh, person was either an accomplished calligrapher or at least uh, an uh, connoisseur, um, connoisseur of the art. The addition of Nizami's famous collection Hamza or quintet um, appeared at a time when several lithographs were already operating in Tigran. Um, the scribe of the book who prepared the text for printing, uh, Nasrullah Tafrishi, left available information about himself the last page of this edition, such as owner of the printing press and the place and time of the copy was made. These uh, were customs uh, carried over from the manuscript copying tradition. Uh, Shiglova describes the information we have about the book, uh, the book's artist, uh, a calligrapher who wrote Nastalik a complex form of Persian calligraphy and worked in lithographic printing for 40 years. We know 15 books he copied from the 
years of 1846 to 1886. Over this time, he worked for various lithographers and published uh, theological works, um, uh, works on fiqh, fiqh Islamic jurisprudence, several dictionaries, uh, um, and poetry collection and historical and um, uh, I know my time is over, unfortunately. Sorry to, to remind that you have three minutes left. Three minutes, okay. Um, um, okay, um, uh, I, I, I will send now to organize a presentation, but if we will have time in the end of this panel, maybe they will, uh, they will or show you in short time. Um, I, I had two examples of visualization of the poetry of Nizami, one from India during the golden age of manuscript writing and painting, and the other from Iran itself. At uh, a turning point in the technology of bookmaking that allowed for greater access to the um, written world, while preserving the beauty of the handcrafted book. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, sorry for this happening. Well, uh, thank you, dear Lana Mijidovna. We really enjoyed uh, uh, your speech and it was full of very interesting, uh, fascinating information about books, printing and miniatures. Of course, we are eager to see these miniatures and we will do it sooner or later, if not today, maybe in the published acts uh, which would follow uh, this conference. Thank you very much again. And uh, now uh, we will listen to the, our next uh, speaker, who is now a, an Italian one. I will present you uh, Giorgio Mafioli Brigatti. I will continue in English. Uh, um, she is from the University of Cambridge, United Kingdom. And uh, uh, also, uh, and uh, Mazi, which is the abbreviation of the Italian name Museo d'Arte della Svizzera Italiano, Lugano, Ticino, Switzerland. And uh, the uh, topic which we'll listen from uh, Professoressa Giorgio Mafioli Brigati is, uh, uh, I will read it in English again, the recognition of the beloved Hasrov and uh, uh, Shirin meet at the palace. You're welcome to, uh, please, uh, 15 minutes again, not more. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank all the scientific committee and in particular, Professor Marina Teresa Javeri uh, for uh, inviting me to speak at this conference today. So I would like to share my screen now so I can start. So the recognition of the beloved Khosrow and Shirin meet at the palace. So I would like to center my, my speech on the idea of recognition of the beloved, because it's something that goes on a lot during the story of Khosrow and Shirin. Indeed, in their first meeting, Khosrow and Shirin did not recognize each other. So Khosrow just saw Shirin bathing at, on a, close to a mountain, but he did not recognize her. And this goes on in the story when there is multiple meetings between Khosrow and Shirin, but they can never be together for a long time. And so I would like to, this is gonna be the lead image of the speech and is the, um, the meeting between Khosrow here represented on a horse and Shirin just looking at Khosrow from the window. And this is a topical moment in the story because Khosrow and Shirin finally kind of meet. Khosrow just goes to her saying all his sorrows for marrying somebody else. Indeed, he made a very big mistake and married Shekhar instead of marrying Shirin, while Shirin was actually waiting for, for him to propose to her. Uh, indeed, the story goes that they are apart for a very long time because of happenings, because of, uh, of chances and of fate, but also because of some uh, choices of Khosrow. So this is a very important moment in the story. And in a way, this image 
can be in a way a summary of the whole story because Khosro and Shirin are very much aparted as they are for the majority of the story. And, but they are longing for each other. So you can see there is an intense looking between them. And, and this is like the idea of the longing for the quest of Khosro for the love of Shirin. This is a very interesting page because you have the text written here on the right hand side that is juxtaposed to the image. So you can see that the image and the text are two different things. And we will see in other examples that I'll show you in a moment how the text and the image are gradually came to be one. And the text actually really talks about this meeting. So Shirin that has prepared for Khosro all these trays of gold, sweets, of beverages to welcome him. But the door of her, pass, of her palace and of her castle actually remains closed. Because indeed, during this meeting, uh, Khosro will not enter the palace of Shirin. In a way, he will not uh, get in a close unity with her. But there will always be a distance because Shirin is actually very, in a way, angry at Khosro that decided to marry Shekar instead of marrying her. So the, the text also at the, at the bottom goes on to say that she was as beautiful as the moon. She was perfectly adorned, just like the moon. And it's very interesting that the artist decided to represent the moon at the top of the page. And the moon is in a perfect oblique line with Shirin. So this is a closer look where you can see that Shirin is like, looks like the moon that in Persian literature, the idea of the moon is very important for, uh, is an attribute of real, real, real beauty. And this is also interesting because in some of Dante and Beatrice representations, you have the same idea of Beatrice being somebody who is, uh, for example, in Divina Commedia, she's actually already in paradise when she meets Dante. And at the same time, the idea of the recognition of the beloved in Dante and Beatrice is of extreme importance. Because Dante is Beatrice, but in a way, the process of recognition of actually her, in a way, transformed into this, into this natural being, actually. It's a very, very closer look. You can see how Jirin is looking only at Rosso, that is, doing this gesture with his hand because there is a dialogue going on on the page. This is a different page that is uh, still representing the same scene. So you have Rosso on the horse with his servants behind him, you have Shiri on the window and you have her servants um, welcoming Rosso with these trays of fruit and beverages. However, here the text is, is very the, it's very apart from the image and you can see that there is a clear um, cut between the text and the image. And the text is much longer. Actually, it starts by saying that Rousseau went with the pretext of going for a hunt, but instead of going for a hunt, he meets Shirin. And this is why it's really interesting to see how the painter really shows this by representing these arrows in the pockets of all the men with Rousseau because they were supposedly going for a hunt. And here Shirin is uh, it's a bit in the background. So you have like the, the main subject of the scene is Rousseau. So if we go back to our lead image, you can see how there is a kind of a difference, but the idea of the palace and of the closed door is also present in the previous one. So you have the palace and the door is really locked for Rousseau. And here instead is a different image that represents a moment that is a little bit later of the story. So Rousseau has arrived and he stays in the, um, in the main square in front, of the paso, in front of the castle of Shirin. And he's sitting on this six legged throne that Shirin prepared for him under this tent. And you can see that here Shirin is always at the window, the door is locked and the text is very, very brief at the top of the page. But it's still interesting because the text says that Rousseau while looking at Shirin kind of swooned. So he was about to fall down from the beautiful throne in which he was sitting. And at the very end, he, the text says that he actually kissed his hand. And I think we can suppose that he kissed his hand to send her a kiss from afar. And this is an interesting, it's a very interesting dynamic because it's not always written in all the texts of Nizami that this happens. And you have here the idea, it's a bit more like a party. So you have 
all the um, servants and maidens and entourage of Rousseau and also the entourage of Shirin on the top of the palace in a sitting and talking and exchanging conversation. And very, very interestingly, you have the representation of pomegranates, which are not really talking about in the text in this, during this meeting, but are a sort of prefiguration of what happens later. So in a later, for example, this is a later stage of the story from another manuscript. I, I forgot to say that all the manuscript pages that I'm showing you are not from the same manuscript. So they're always different, but I chose them because of the way the theme is represented and how the story is, um, is told with the images. So here we find again the pomegranates and this is the moment in which Rousseau and Shirin finally marry. Here for the first time, we're taking inside the construction of the palace. So you are inside the palace. You can see that this is, uh, you would have a door in which you would enter. You have a big um, room with a beautiful carpet. You have maidens, you have different entourage people and you have the pomegranates, which are very important for what is going on. And I will tell you a bit more about it later. I just want to say that the structure of the palace is of great importance here because you have the, um, the writing of, of the story of Mizami is actually inside, ingrained inside the palace. And it's very interesting that you would read it, the top line from right to left, as it's usual for, for Farsi. So you would read from here up to the final line. But then at the bottom, the scribe decided to uh, make the readers read from left to right. So the actual sequence of these lines goes from left. So this is one, two, three, four. And in a way, this takes the eyes of the viewer into complete a sort of circle. And a circle closes as if it closes on the unity of the Rousseau and Shirin. And in the way is the final, is the, like the closure of the circle of the quest of Rousseau for the love of Shirin. So I will just zoom a bit more on the image and you have here the, uh, the main uh, uh, priest of Zoroastrian origin, that is Mobad, that is actually written here in the text. And Rousseau asks this Mobad to sit down and actually start the ceremony of their marriage. So I will tell you now that the pomegranates are a very important fruit of paradise. And it, they, it, the pomegranates in general represent fertility, happiness, and to have them during a marriage is very important. Here you also have the cypress that is the symbol of the beloved, of the slender figure of the beloved, and it's very important in Persian poetry. So this is very interesting to have this idea of uh, their talking. So Rousseau is talking to the Mobad about the, um, about the ceremony, and you have here also wine being served, you have the maidens talking to one another, you have this idea of feast and of a relaxed situation. Instead, if uh, this is another closer, closer look up, just to show you the details of the manuscript, how beautiful it is and how detailed it is. So if we go back to our lineage, we can see that in comparison with the previous that I just showed you of the ceremony, the party, like the feast going on, here there is a kind of longing. You can see from this, the construction of the image that there is this idea of longing and there is a kind of tension with the lines that are created. And the same tension, it's possible to see in this other beautiful illuminated that it's a bit later on. So it's towards the end of the Safavid period. So it's 1632. And this represents the episode in which Rousseau slays the lion. And he does so, as the text says, as Mostan, that is like drunk, way but is also drunk in love so because of this this little sort of drunkenness he's in he decides to slay the lion because the lion entered into his um into the place where he was staying and he just stood up and went to fight for this lion and it's very interesting because in this text the text is um really leaves the tension to rise because it finishes saying about the the um, the fighting between Rousseau and the lion, but it doesn't say how it ends. And similarly, the painter decides to represent Rousseau fighting with the lion, but it doesn't say how it ends. So there is this idea of rising tension. And the very important thing about this, this beautiful illuminated page is that the very artist signs at the bottom. 
So he signs his name down here as Reza Abbasi. That was one of the most important um, painters of the court of the Safavid ruler. And you have the image that starts to go beyond the borders of the frame. So you have here and here, you can see that the image itself goes beyond the border of the frame as much as here. So it's like the lion just jumped from outside the page. And another very interesting thing. Thank you very much. And here we have this mystical figure represented uh, behind uh, these two on onlookers. And we really don't know who this figure is, but there are many ideas going on about it. And I think it can also be a kind of, as it's represented in his eyes, so black and white, it might be a reference to some of the printed images that were circulating in Iran at the time. I would like to end just by showing you this, um, this very interesting artwork by Shafzia Sikander, who is a contemporary artist of today. And uh, this is called the scroll. As a scroll it unfolds as a, it, in a way, there is some Chinese inspiration, but this is to show that the actual construction and the idea of the construction of space and architecture of, Safavi, of the Safavi period is not just something old that has been now, uh, that today is not found anymore. It's still in contemporary artworks because it has this power of representing something representing the space, representing tensions, representing all these um, sensations in a way that is very important for some artists. So in this scroll, Shahzia is trying to represent the unfolding of an epic poem, the unfolding of a lifetime. And in a way, it's a sort of representation of her own self. And very quickly, you will see herself walking up the stairs, going up to the uh, upper rooms. There are... Uh, many references to Safavid culture and at the end you have once again the idea of somebody looking from the window, somebody sitting below and it's herself here making a self-portrait or a portrait of the woman seated in a sort of interesting way of um, rereading the Safavid architecture in contemporary moments. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, grazie, uh, gentile editoressa. Really, uh, we are grateful for your support for each. Uh, we had left us to revisit one of the beautiful, love, romantic poems of Nizami, Hazrov and Shirin, and uh, which was accompanied uh, by, uh, I would say, a rich panorama of. Uh, signs, uh, symbols, uh, spaces, and beautiful images. Grazie molto, thank you very much. Thank you. And now we will pass uh, um, to our third uh, speaker, who is uh, Dr. Carla Forno from uh, Fondazione Centro Studio Alfiriani, Italy. Yeah. Bene, grazie, thank you very much. Eh, ringrazio gli organizzatori e saluto tutti i presenti. Il mio contributo intende porre in evidenza i momenti salienti del rapporto dialettico uh, instaurato. Di as far as my presentation is concerned, I would like, like to. Uh, at the moment, there are various meanings uh, of the comparison, comparative analysis and coding of information uh, that were uh, in 17th and 18th centuries. I would like to know that uh, there were various portrayals of Dante's works uh, and he was writing in Italian vernacular and therefore um, the uh, 
чуть-чуть слабо идет. Я плохо, плохо слышу. Извините. And it was hard to uh, make these uh, presentations. Uh, both Petrarca and Boccaccio and Toscano, uh, the, uh, uh, there were very various uh, definitions made. And uh, the inscriptions increased in number. And Dante uh, actually was using the Florentine uh, style. So it was Niccolo Livornio who actually presented. Uh, uh, so the grammar of Petrarch and Boccaccio in Dante's interpretation was slightly different. Uh, and there are three books uh, published. Uh, one of them is attributed to the style of Dante. And a lot of expressions are explained there. For instance, it is mentioned that uh, the vernacular, the popular Italian uh, expressions and languages and uh, uh, phrases were not met unanimously by the audience in general. And uh, uh, attempts to link Dante with Madrilio were actually uh, exploited by the researchers in 1730. There were a new scientific works published uh, which use some iconographic elements of Dante's works, iconographic images. Some of them were quite famous. And, um, the, well, Giordano Bruno, Tommaso Canella's uh, uh, works were researched by scholars and uh, they ultimately uh, came up with uh, books published in a new scientific language. And uh, like in Toscana, so uh, the coded context of Dante's work uh, was compared to that of Homer. Uh, so uh, they uh, understood their historic mission as uh, uh, the uh, in the in, in in a way that Dante was the first, the pioneer in a way in promoting uh, works in Italian vernacular and popular Italian language. So he came up with a new dimension, so to say. Uh, so we would like to also note in this respect that in Venice, uh, back in uh, 1558, uh, there were uh, uh, a person named Gasparo Gotze who published works by Dante and uh, he Actually, while explaining it, he kind of presented it in the form of dialogue as if he was entering into conversation with Dante. And then other researchers um, also um, entered into polemics. And here, um, Bettinelli. Um, was uh, involved in these researches, particularly in Greece. They published the works of Dante in Greek and uh, the Divine Comedy, uh, well, was something that uh, they wanted to better study in Europe and the French school of Dante studies is uh, also pretty much developed. So um, 
what I want to mention with that is that the French scientific circles um, actually uh, made very thorough studies of Dante's legacy and uh, in 1930s, 1940s, uh, well, uh, there was another uh, work published by Dante dedicated to himself, to Dante. Uh, and uh, that was more uh, trying to present his characters as ignorant people. And in the middle of the century, they were rehabilitated. Uh, the approach to Dante's uh, legacy was more rehabilitative. And um, uh, they tried to um, accommodate uh, Dante's work to the modern world. So, Back in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, the researchers uh, tried to uh, get the works of Dante to think that we are doing them today. Uh, so uh, today, uh, speaking of Dante's uh, works, and the importance of his legacy. Uh, well, we have a significant number of researches, and as of 18th century, uh, the scientific works to Dante's legacy were increasing. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dante got even a greater recognition in the Italian society, and they started uh, studying him in a better organized manner. So ultimately, um, if you take our um, research, the scientific model that is applied to Dante, trying to identify what sense it, uh, well, what, what value his legacy has, uh, trying to reveal new historic layers beneath his uh, uh, legacy. We, oh, we also re refer to Petrarca, to other literary uh, figures in Italy. Um, so altogether that puts quite a challenge towards the modern um, researchers uh, so that uh, the scientific works and researches that were made uh, so far need to be uh, also studied. And I would like to say that there are uh, some scientific works uh, and new bibliography according uh, to we uh, while there is a person to proper study them we also understand that today the methodology that we're employing uh, is given a particular appropriacy to us and they still may uh, well benefit a lot or change a lot uh, based on the original stories and we believe that uh, uh, over time Dante's uh, works will become more and more topical for the problems of the 21st century and that will uh, boost up the new books to be edited and uh, if we uh, have that as our purpose and look at the scientific works published so far on the issue, we'll see that most of them uh, deal with the works that were penned back in the 18th, 19th century. So if uh, today we are employing the, uh, the if we uh, 
enter the museum of anti-Irani, uh, well, which is one of the, um, uh, well, and, uh, which has some very interesting uh, visual artworks, and some of them are made in the 18th, 19th century. Uh, the museum of Ali-Gheri uh, Ali uh, is uh, very interesting, so it would be appropriate to get better familiar with the exhibits and uh, this museum uh, well as a very side search on this issue so both figurative visual and scientific uh, studies were held so uh, this should become the issue of international cooperation because in modern world you can't do it other way and uh, our efforts should be joined and uh, that is the way we're trying to uh, prepare our uh, articles and works uh, and bring new elements and Excuse new gentile, doctor, uh, three ideas into our research. Uh, the issue that was mentioned times and again, uh, you only have three minutes, professor, to end. Yes, uh, with that, We have uh, the variety of uh, descriptions of various regions in Italy, and uh, this is, uh, well, the studies of this big and famous um, works uh, should be systematized and um, streamlined and this is also very important for us so uh, the um, we try to uh, introduce the new system uh, which is very encouraging and provides us with an impetus to furthermore continue this efforts down the road Also, would like to mention that uh, we would also like to uh, to get the translations of these uh, works and uh, share of the works with our colleagues, because that's the only way we can really promote the poets in a new manner in a very interesting way in an unexpected format so um uh i think that our joint efforts may yield very positive results and uh, we uh, should constantly work on that and we should furthermore reinforce our cooperation in that particular area to join our resources uh, and with this coming to dante's legacy uh, we should continue our efforts uh, in promoting thank you uh, thank you uh, uh, and and we are grateful for uh, this excellent and uh, uh, deep survey uh, of the 18th uh, 19th uh, century uh, following dante like with such uh, great names uh, as uh, john Battista vico uh, Voltaire, etc., etc. Thank you very much. And so uh, we are passing to our uh, third uh, um, 
who is uh, uh, Alberto Gabriele from the uh, Università di Cassino e del Lazio Meridionale, Italia. Uh, the title of his uh, report, of his speech is uh, The Body of Translation, uh, the Roman de la Rose and the Formalization of the Embodied Experience of the Linguistic Act in the Italian and English literary traditions. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I also want to thank uh, Marina Javeri for her kind invitation. And I'm particularly pleased to be joining this uh, discussion after Professor Talib's uh, paper from yesterday, which gave us this interesting insight into the Zoroastrian origin of the image of the rose. So I'm working on another rose, which is much more materialistic and sensuous is, but it's, as you can imagine, in Dante, both uh, material and transfigured into a kind of divine language that's not written by God, but is a fiction, as Dante says in his uh, treaty, uh, De, De Vulgare Eloquenza, on writing in the vernacular language. So taking the suggestion from Professor Fusillo from the first day, I'm going to try and graft uh, uh, some philology into comparative studies, which is you know, the way comparative literature came to be at the end of the 18th century, you know, in Göttingen, in Daniena, et cetera. So these are my inspirations. So uh, the medieval French love encyclopedia, uh, Le Roman de la Rose, experienced a wide manuscript circulation and inspired different forms of adaptations, translations, and abridgments in the course of the 14th century. Ascribed to the works of two poets, Guillaume de Lory and Jean de Meun, the latter continuing from where the first had left the work unfinished, the Roman de la Rose questions the notion of authorship. Our post-international and post -international copyright legislation era is redefined. The romantic cult of the individual poet and its quasi-divine status saved the way, as we know, for the recognition of the legal protection of literary production, uh, legal and economic. This stress on individual genius poet is obviously far from the medieval notion of authorship, I would say, so much so that the distinction between the two French authors uh, is often blurred. It's not always clear who began and when and how. Jean de Meun, whose intellectual sources weave didactic poetry and the new approaches to natural philosophy championed by the school of Chartres, would soon become the only recognized author and authoritas, an authority in the field, to the point that legends were created on his fame. His work at the origins of French literature was well known in the Italian and English traditions through translations and reworkings. In this paper, I want to chart the translation of French sources and canonical terms belonging to the semantic field of courtly law in the Italian and English traditions, choosing a chronological span extending from the medieval to the Renaissance period. It's not so relevant for my purpose to decide once and for all who translated the romance of the rose into Italian and English, but rather to consider the semantic field of courtly love in order to posit an intertextual macro text along a transnational trajectory of cultural formation that is methodologically necessary when dealing with the context. Each poet confronted with the foreignness of the culturally dominant French literary tradition devised different strategies of cultural assimilation, which may include borrowings, targeted oriented translations, and a playful understandings of the source language. I'm also interested in identifying the discursive pull in the direction of nationalism that seeped into the domesticating process of translation. I shall also uh, chart the more dispersed circulation of the same canonical terms in the linguistic system of some of Shakespeare's poetic and theatrical works to probe the survival or other transformation of these terms to the point of losing the original semantic definition. Translation acts range from the simple adaptation to a new definition, at times to parody, misunderstanding, and ultimately a normative alignment of the body of the translator to the power structure of the time. Translations have often signaled in the course of literary history the foundational point of a new tradition. Lucretius's Latin translation of Greek Epicurean philosophy in a language that had no philosophical tradition is one of the many examples. The medieval translation of the Arab Aristotelic texts into Latin at the court of Alfonso X in Spain shaped the new episteme of scholastic philosophy. Translations become foundational texts, or rather, the works of canonical authors, commonly placed at the origin of national literatures, stem from a more or less acknowledged act of translation. 
a translation of the French poem, uh, Le Roman de la Rose, has been attributed to both Chaucer and Dante in the early phase of their poetic activity and early work. The issue in both cases has been for a long time controversial, not only because there are not many existing manuscripts, but because the attribution has questioned the unique originality of each of the two founding figures and touched the chords of national identity. Can a different prosodic structure in two fragments of the medieval English version account for a different authorship, thus making the claim for a single authorship by Chaucer less tenable? Can the divine poet Dante with capital letters treat such trivial matters in the go-between language of the Fiore, the title of the Italian translation of the Romance of the Rose, that sounds too foreign to a nationally scholar's ear accustomed only to the later canonical works by Dante? Both remarks seem to derive from a critical approach focusing authors with capital A and their predictable reactions and moves within a system of values and priorities that are funnily enough particularly pressing for the critic and the literary historian rather than the historical context. Nationalism has played a major role in the shaping of the narrative of literary history. One may think in the English context of the Renaissance courtly figure Philip Sidney and his argument for the assumed superiority of the English prosodic possibilities over the French and Italian ones expressed in his defense of poetry at a time in which the assertion of power of the English monarchy and its global reach flex its cultural muscle. We just heard of these acquisitions uh, of uh, Persian manuscripts and I guess the money came from Queen Elizabeth's establishing uh, the company of merchants, right? And we know the plundering that has been going on by uh, the early stage of uh, the British imperial power. The English and Italian translations of the Romans attributed to Dante and Chaucer allow to identify different degrees of allegiance to a national language. Translation therefore responds to different ideological pressures, shaping the choice of words among several existing synonyms. Both Italian translation and attributed Dante and the one to Chaucer are conscious of the linguistic system they were molding, of the foundational choice of a given dialect, however motley, against the many dialects or even foreign languages which were used by their contemporaries, like Brunetto, Latini, and Gower. This is a polylingual environment. Translation Therefore, the foundation of a new tradition of poetic conventions. An early approximative forerunner of the innovative terza rima rhyming scheme can be found in the complex rhyme pattern of the Italian translation of the Fiore sonnets, thus anticipating what Dante created in the Divine Comedy. And in the case of Charles's translation, a regular prosodic structure leading to the use of the pentameter. The domesticating process in the Italian English translations, however, takes two distinctive directions. The discourse of courtly love in both remain an unaltered modality of genteel perfection that may extend from lyrical poetry to the mien and behavior of the upper classes represented in the Canterbury Tales by the gentle knight in the prologue, the courtier squire also in the prologue of uh, Chaucer's uh, work, and the prioress uh, whose courtesy is stressed again. But also not only just the kind of upper classes, but also the aspirations of the bourgeois classes that model the behavior after the upper classes, a move that Alison in the Wife of Bath's tale clearly advocates for with the more materialistic interest. In the after aforementioned tale, the old woman quotes Dante to dismiss the dangerous attitude of the knight towards a common woman like she is. Alison uses the by then established authorities of Dante's work as it serves her purpose well, the new bourgeoisie bourgeois definition of nobility found in Dante's Convivio does not need any corrections, unlike the anthology of misogynistic quotes that Alison reports in the prologue only to unmask their faults one by one in the past desturance of her compelling arguments. I'm focusing for the sake of brevity on the names associated with the psychomachia of love as they appear at a significant place in the verse, the rhyming end of it. Courtesy and gentility recur both in Italian and English translations as part of the canonical linguistic choices available to medieval poets. The rest of the virtues the perfect lover should acquire are not translated similarly by the two poets. Oh, sorry, the translator. Yes, I'm really sorry. I have to respect and I should have sent uh, uh, my speech before. So I really apologize for creating this uh, difficult uh, moment of translation uh, live. So sorry. Both the Italian and the English text adopt many French words, often preserving their etymological form or at times using linguistic calque. Courtoisie is echoed in cortesia and curtsy, whereas uh, 
Dulce Regard becomes Dolce Riguardo in the Italian, but sweet looking, that's a translation, in the Chaucer translation. The tendency to employ a calque recurs more in the English than in the Italian translation. Desperance finds its English equivalent in Wenhoff, Barat in Guy, Bielacoel translates the French Bielacoel in the first fragment, but by the end of the English version, it becomes fair welcoming, rooted in the English, not the French uh, um, kind of calque. Chaucer's diction, even in fragmentary translation of the Romance of the Rose, does not seem to stabilize a particular usage throughout the text. It evolves towards a marketed English usage that goes against an international model of assimilation that adopts French forms. French borrowings, by contrast, abound in the English translation, but not in the overwhelming proportion of the Fiore. The Italian poem franchises Franco-Italian words throughout its sonnets, not simply in the predicament constraints of rhyming words, which in English too demand the couples amorous and savoros, visage and usage, semblance and countenance is as obvious. The Italian translator's intervention on the narrative parts and on the didactic excursus, while signaling his intellectual engagement, do not affect the general sense of foreignness of the Franco-Italian language, which determines the translation. The Francophone register is also recurring presence in Dante's comedy. So he's absorbing this foreignness, not just making it English as somehow Chaucer may have done. Um, French borrowings like Gibetto, Acismare, and Arra occur also in the Romance of the Rose, which Dante might have had in mind, echoed later in his self-reflexive poetic activity. His indebtedness to the French tradition appears throughout the comedy. So the French is respected as a source of the inspiration in the repeated homage according to several French poets, such as the Provencal Bertrand de Born, uh, Arnold Daniel uh, in Purgatorio, I'm skipping a few, and he speaks in Provencal in Dante's work. So the Italian switches to a different language. The tension between a national language, however poly philologically polyglot it may be, and the foreignness of the language of cultural affiliation is at stake in any literary history, but it is obviously dominant at the time like the Elizabethan age, Matisse and study, in which translation was foundational act, capable of reviving, reinventing, or creating a new tradition. Chaucer's uh, translation was first published in 1532, appeared among other published translations, uh, contemporary English versions of classical and modern languages. The case of Shakespeare is relevant not only because of the source studies that can trace every linguistic or thematic influence deriving from the map text of Elizabeth translated works. In Henry V, Shakespeare goes as far as dramatizing the clash of English and French cultures, the tensions of appropriation and the institutional dynamics of translation of malapropism. Yeah, it's impossible. It has been often regarded as a national, even a propaganda play in the glory of the British nation through the history of one of its founders, offers a battle language skirmish between two foreign armies. Soldiers from both armies speak the language of the enemy, and the whole scenes are spoken in French and translated by an interpreter. So language, uh, um, linguistic appropriation is actually staged in Shakespeare, which is um, really interesting in um, Act 4, Scene 4. So um, I am also traced the, the presence of uh, kind of the core terms of courtly love in uh, Shakespeare's early works, in his uh, um, sonnets, but I'm also interested in identifying when a word such as courtesy is then turned to, which is this kind of bodily function of kind of paying homage. So it comes from courtesy, but it loses this uh, kind of medieval, very, very uh, charged uh, semantic meaning. Um, so uh, the, um, and, and we have examples in Roman Juliet, in As You Like It, I'm skipping those, uh, which are I think, uh, very interesting. Uh, so, um, court courtesy, the liberal generosity, wanting nothing in return, time in Richard Shakespeare's language, and these are my conclusions, was twisted into a curtsy, a formal gesture in which the body of the speaker performs the act of cultural belonging to the conventions of courtly life by adhering to a ritualized bodily performance the singles, the emergence of an early formalization of biopolitical power. Discussed in etiquette books such as The Courtier, the how-to instant book of Renaissance courtly society, the curtsy enters the discursive space that co the body in a ritualized performance of the structures of power while emptying out 
the original meaning of courtesy. Curtsy embodies signal a literal speech act in which the linguistic meaning conveyed may do without words and join a mechanized choreography of the body that reinforces the power it bows to. The curtsy is both an affirmation of power and encoded subjugation to power itself. It is a bodily translation of a semantic field that paves the way for the modern automatic gestures we perform wherever, whenever we operate in the biopolitical functioning of our modern states. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear professor. Thank you for the uh, very uh, deep uh, and uh, really comparative uh, excursion uh, to the European uh, literature of uh, Middle Ages, French, English, and uh, it was uh, very interesting and we followed you uh, with uh, much interest. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, with the Professor Alberto Gabriele, we are uh, concluding the Italian uh, part of our panel and it's a kind of a frame. We are uh, again uh, listening to the uh, Russian speaker. Uh, she is Marina and I will use uh, the Russian onomastic tradition uh, patronymics, uh, Marina Gennadievna Mirkulova from the uh, Russian State University for the uh, Humanities and Moscow State Pedag Pedagogical University, Russia. And the title of uh, her speech uh, will be from uh, me to Vakhtangov. How did the Oriental princess become a symbol of the new Russian theater of the 20th uh, century. You are welcomed, Marina uh, Gennadievna. Pajalost. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. I want uh, uh, to say um, make many thanks to all people who organized this um, great conference. And I, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to take part in this magnificent uh, magnific, uh, project. So I will try to show, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's okay with this presentation? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, the topic of my report is from Nizami to Vaktangov. How did an Oriental princess become a symbol of a new Russian theater of the 20th century. So imagine the beginning of the 20th century, Moscow, Arbat Street, small house, ground floor apartment, end of February. Evgeny Vaktangov dies here. He is terminally ill. The day before, the director held the last rehearsals of the play Princess Turandot. He is full of inspiration, but he has no strength. Mm -hmm. Vaktangov is only 39 years old. Theater is his life's work. But his father, a large tobacco manufacturer, was against the theater. Stanislavski saw Vaktangov's talent and instructed him to conduct practical classes according to his method of acting. However, Vachtangov soon developed his own understanding of theater. Vachtangov's slogan is fantastic realism. And the most striking embodiment of this method was Princess Turandot. Intermission during the premiere. Stanislavski takes a cap and hurries to Vachtangov. He runs into the room and shoots. Now, wrap yourself in a blanket as in a toga and fall asleep in a Venus sleep. You put on a wonderful performance. I predict a great future for it. And so all is happened. It's been a hundred years ago. Princess Turandot has become the hallmark of not only the theater by Evgeny Vachtangov, but the entire Vachtangov school. Vachtangov's bright farewell has literary roots. The tale Turandot became famous thanks to the Italian playwright of the 18th century, Carla Gozzi. But the story of the tale is unexpected. The plot 
belongs to the wandering and is found among different people. It's believed that Gotze drew it from the works of the medieval poet Nizami Ganjavi. Nizami wrote the poem Seven Beauties at the beginning of the 12th century, and it became a classic of the genre. In one of the seven parts of Nizami's poem, a Slavic princess with a non-Slavic name Nazrin Nush made riddles to the Eastern ruler Shah Bahram. The princess thus personified the state which was to be inherited only by the most worthy. However, it's little known that the uh, path of the Eastern princess from Nizami to Gotze and from there to the theatrical stage of Moscow was quite intricate. Nizami's poem is written in Persian. Thanks to the Persian language, as well as because of the amusing plots, beautiful style, magnificent episodes, Nizami's works spread easily and quickly outside of Ganja. In the 18th century, the magical world of the East burst into European life. The French Orientalist Francois Petit de la Croix brought Nizami's fairy tale to France. Francois Petit de la Croix um, was born in Paris in the family of translator, and he inherited his father's profession. He spent over 10 years in Syria, Persia, and Turkey, learning Arabic, Persian, and Turkish, and collecting a collection of rare oral materials and a variety of oriental poets. At the beginning of the 18th century, Francois Petit de la Croix published a collection of fairy tales, A Thousand and One Days. No name of authors were indicated in this collection. Francois Petit de la Croix noted that he lost the Persian book in which it was published and didn't know the author. Much later, it was established that Nizami was the author of the tale of Turandot. Although the very Persian name of the princess, Turandot or Turandot, daughter of the land of Turan, undoubtedly belongs to Francois Petit de la Croix. So, um, so, um, um, in, French, in French collection, this uh, tale was published under the title The Story of Prince Calab and the Chinese Princess. Carlo Gozzi became the most famous Italian playwright after staging Princess Turandot in Venice. Gozzi's play gave birth to a number of subsequent translations. The most famous translation is by Friedrich Schiller. And if in Gotze's play has a light sarcastic tone, then in Schiller it was sentimental, full of symbolism. Evgeny Vaktangov resolutely chose Gotze's version. He wanted to play China, which is played in Italy. He told uh, his actors, uh, imagine you are Italian actors who play China. Uh, this means an instant change of pictures Mm -hmm. This mean um, uh, um, this mean an instant change of pictures, the light on conventional scenery, men when on stage in solemn tailcoats and ladies in evening dresses. Mm -hmm. The audience was also allowed to shoot from the spot, and the actors caught their lines and parried them. Before the war, in one thousand nine hundred and fourteen. Princess Turandot was played for the thousand time. And all this time, the performance was an event for Moscow. The play was staged in Stockholm, Göteborg, Berlin, Paris. The performance divided the Russian theater into before and after. In total, in the 20th, uh, 20th century, the play Princess Turandot was resumed at the Vachtanga Theater three times. As for me, I saw the last version in the early 90s of the last century. And the second version can be viewed 
uh, on the internet, the play was filmed by television, and now everybody can see uh, the second version uh, in internet. Today, at the theater by Evgeny Vaktandov, play Princess Turandot does not go. But anyone can see the legendary heroine near the entrance to the theater. There is a golden fountain in the form of sculpture of Turandot. Very romantic. Evgeny Vaktandov's life was cut short on takeoff. And today we regard Princess Turandot as a master's manifestory. The main question is, why did a simple oriental tale about capricious princess become a symbol of the new Russian theater and the basis of the entire trend of fantastic realism? We remember it was a period of revolution and Vakhtangov gave people an incredible holiday. Today in the world, there is a lot of controversy. Uh, today in the world, there is a lot of um, uh, controversy about why the theater is needed, and especially why it is needed in the most difficult times for the world. During the pandemic, theaters around the world were closed. The theater considered unimportant. You can live without theater. Um, many, many people now th uh, think like this. You can live without theater. And for me, this is an alarming sign. For Evgeny Vaktangov, the question of why a theater is needed was not raised. He answered it in his diaries. The theater should be a holiday. A man has come to the theater. It means he has come to rejoice. Who knows? Maybe this move for the joy of life, in spite of any trials, Vachtanga felt in the walk of the great and passionate poet of the East, Nizami Kanjili. Thank you. Thank you, Maya Gennadievna. We are grateful for your very interesting speech. And uh, thank you that you had reminded us this really legendary uh, performance. Every one of uh, those who know Russian culture um, had heard. Uh, I've never seen, unfortunately. But now, after your indication, I would uh, watch using new means, um, and I would look the ver the new version of this legendary performance, uh, Princess uh, Turandot. And thank you also that you had finished uh, a bit in before time. So, um, though all the speakers were rather disciplined, uh, anyway, somehow it happens that uh, we are swift, swift in and uh, the time for our discussion is less than we hoped. So we have something a bit more than 10 minutes to, to be on time. And now we are starting our uh, discussion. Please, we are inviting you to make your comments, suggestions, additions. Please, you're welcomed. Пожалуйста, per favore. I have a question. I'm not sure how to raise my hand. So I, I can wait if someone raised the hand before me. Um, Professor Alberto, you are the first, okay, please. Thank you. So I have a question for the first two speakers. Um, when I visited the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Art in Istanbul, I was really struck by the use of color in the Persian uh, tradition, or maybe that's what I noticed. It was a kind of uh, some kind of interesting innovation. So what I'm curious to know in a kind of course comparative way in of opening paths and connections was uh, from the first speaker, if there was any kind of reception, any kind of analysis in the English context of this kind of artistic qualities of um, these Persian manuscripts that were being bought. You know, we don't know the, the history of the early 17th century ones, but we know that history of art is formalized around you know, the end of, of the, uh, throughout the um, 16th century. So I'm curious to know if the English tradition tries and create a narrative uh, through artistic uh, interpretation of the art. And the question for Georgia, and thank you again for the great presentation, is again about color. I mean, where does it come from? Am I wrong in noticing this unique style? And can we start making connections between East and West? Um, I remember Jensen's argument in the history of art saying that it was the Persian manuscripts 
uh, representation of landscape that entered Europe and made possible somehow, you know, the, the first discovery of space, you know, inspired by the School of Chartres, but also, you know, by Renaissance art. And I was just curious about this, you know, use of color, which of course in Europe goes in many directions. And again, I don't know anything about the field, so it would be great to hear if there's any suggestion on your part. Professor, uh, thank you for your question. So uh, if uh, Lana Medjidovna is ready for the reply, we are waiting. If not, uh, uh, Lana Medjidovna, if uh, Lana Medjidovna is speaking too fast again. Okay. And uh, uh, if uh, Professoress uh, Mafiole Brigati is ready, we would uh, uh, listen to her reply. Yes, I'm ready. If Lana is not, I can go first. So I, um, I just wanted to say that, yes, the use of color is of great importance, but we also have to remember that many of these colors were actually from the Middle Eastern lands. So the kind of blue that is uh, uh, in Italian, uh, blue oltremarino, so this very, very strong blue actually comes from those lands. And also the use of saffron can be used for colors as well. It's also from Iranian land or, I mean, Middle Eastern uh, spaces. And this is very important to note that, for example, uh, the whole Venetian tradition yeah, of... I was thinking about that. Yes, yes the whole tradition of Carta Turchina really comes from that Turkish blue paper that was um, that was uh, bought and uh, tra transformed from Italy, like from Turkey to Italy, and then went back and forth. So I think color is one of the greatest uh, traditions of um, of Islamic manuscripts. But also, really, you can see that the connection between East and West was really, really intertwined. Was very, very close, and we would not have those beautiful Giotto ceilings without the ultramarine blue. So I Thank think you for the materialist we... reading of art. Very interesting. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not saying, but uh, it's... Well, somehow it's... you're suggesting. The material... We didn't get only peaches from Iran, see? Yeah, the material is very important. Apple. But I was, as I was trying to say in my presentation, there is also something coming from the West to the East. So yes. for example, in the 17th century, there were many printed images that were, um, that were taken from Italy or from different parts of Europe to Iran, and they inspired many artists. Of course, the connection and the conception of architecture in Islamic manuscripts have been mostly uh, misunderstood because people thought that they didn't know perspective, they had no idea how to represent something in perspective, but it's just the tradition of Islamic manuscripts, so it's a bit different. And this is why I also wanted to say something about contemporary art because today is not just that you just get perspective because it's better. It's a different way of expressing your yourself. I don't know if you Thank answered you the much. question or if you have something more to. Okay. Well, I was thinking of the northern of the Dutch idea is with this more perspective, but again, it's just a pure association. Yeah. Thank you, George, for your uh, replies. Oh, about uh, eight minutes for other questions or comments. So please uh, raise your hands, those who want to, to uh, say something, please. You are welcomed. Uh, I will unmute myself. Uh, I have a comment on uh, the Georgia Brigatti's presentation. It was very interesting and how you uh, intersected this miniature with the the narration of the uh, Kusrova and Shirin. I want to uh, make a comment uh, that the, the illustration, the, the manuscript, um, the miniature illustration of Kusrov wrestling uh, the tiger or was a lion. I think it, uh, how it, you, you mentioned it very rightly that how it overrules the borders of the miniature, it creates a 3D effect. It was, it, I think it's kind of a, um, it's a, beyond their time that he mentioned, he used us how to, uh, how uh, a miniature or the, the figures in the miniature can exceed beyond or go beyond their, all the space that they are fitted in. So it, I found it very interesting. And also when you first uh, name the leading uh, miniature that you described, I think the, the lines and, and, and stuff, it was very, a bit strict and harsh and it was a bit solid. And whenever you, we reach to the 
moment with Ravan Shree and I'm getting married, the the uh, the space also gets round and it uh, it's, it's what I felt while I was uh, listening and also watching uh, the the manuscripts and the that you share. That's it. Thank you. Yes, if I can say just a few more things, it's just on that image where you can see that the image is going beyond the frame of the page. It's actually a very important time in, uh, in the manuscript tradition because it's the first time at the beginning of the 17th centuries when artists like Reza Abdi, that's the artist of that page painting, start to make the single folio images that were just sold and bought on the market. So there is this idea that illuminations and beautiful paintings are not only like they don't only belong to books and to manuscript, but they can be perfect works of art by themselves. So they can be just like a single page painting. And this is what you can see in that one as well, that the image is in a way complete. You have the text, you have the image and everything is complete. And this idea that the image goes beyond the borders is actually important because it's the first time that the artist as well start to um, state their names, they start to sign themselves, they get a kind of status in the society that is a bit different from the past. Because for example, the lead image instead comes from a manuscript workshop. So manuscripts were produced in workshops and you have this um, complementary artists working on the same page. And this is why it's a bit more structured because you have people writing, people making the architecture, people painting the faces, Everything is more active work, while the last image, I mean, it's at least thought about in the art history um, field of, of the moment, it's more like a single artist stating his own, uh, his own practice and his own expression, she signed work. Of course, there were helpers of the artist, but it was less, it was not like a workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have the uh, for me and uh, dear colleagues, if you have other comments or questions, uh, you're most welcome. I have a quick question for Marina again, but I'll be second to anyone else. Shall we uh, go ahead? Please go ahead. Thank you again uh, to you as well for your presentation. I was just, just curious since, you know, as a segue from uh, George's presentation was this interesting representation of space. If uh, the stage design in the Vartango's 23 production has something to tell us about space, where, as you said, at the time of the avant-garde, it's very militant, may decide who's with us, who's against us. I'm just curious about the space, the representation of space on stage, if there's any, I don't know, reconstruction or anything interesting to say about that. Uh, so about atmosphere in the-, the space on stage, the, the props, mm -hmm. the stage- so so I, I, I understand um, okay, uh, Evgeny Vartangov was a um, um, uh, great figure in theater who, um, who opened fantastic realism. And fun what is fantastic realism? It is method uh, where uh, is together um, deeply uh, psychological um, role is very simple operation. Uh, no, no large decoration, no big, great costumes, no, only people, only um, uh, his emotions. This is Vachtangov. So um, um, why uh, Princess Turandot was um, the event for Moscow? Because uh, we all people see new people. It was new people uh, without decoration, without um, special costumes. Um, uh, um, uh, only, only light, um, uh, light, um, light emotion, but not uh, great decoration. Uh, so um, uh, I think uh, today, see um, um, by Evgeny Vachtangov today by new uh, director Rima Stuminas, it's um, the, um, it's like uh, like legendary Vachtangov. And uh, if you will be in Moscow, maybe uh, I um, uh, I want uh, you be able to uh, see it uh, uh, by Evgeny Vachtangov and see uh, what is now what is now Vachtangov's method because Rima Stuminas do um, maybe maybe like and maybe the same. 
Thank you. Thank you, Marina Gennadievna, for your comment, for your invitation to Moscow. I hope that many... Oh, to all. I, I, let the pandemia finish and we all go to Moscow to... Baku. I need a visa. I need an invitation. To, to all, all, all. I am so... I am sorry, dear colleagues, but I am afraid that we have no space, using this uh, term, for our uh, next uh, discussion. Uh, because uh, the time of our panel um, is finishing and of course we are waiting uh, for the published uh, acts uh, because today a lot of um, attention was devoted uh, to the visual matter so we really need uh, to see uh, calmly to see uh, your images especially the missing images of the uh, first um, report or the first paper so once again thank uh, you very much all our uh, speakers our colleagues and uh, i will tell you the next program uh, we have a coffee break for uh, 15 minutes uh, at uh, uh, 1525 uh, Roman time, 1725 Baku's time, uh, panel number seven is starting. So uh, now you have a time for cafe, cappuccino, or il te, or chai, whatever you want. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Do thank you. Grazie, grazie, Mikhail. Thank you.